Welcome to the Cyber Insider, MCSoft's podcast all about cybersecurity. Your hosts today are Brett Callow, Threat Analyst here at MCSoft, and I'm Luke Connolly, Partner Manager. And we're very excited to have Katie Mazuris with us today. In case anyone isn't familiar with Katie, she's the founder and CEO of Luda Security, a company that helps organizations implement and manage bug bounty programs. Prior to starting Luda Security, she worked at companies including At Stake, Symantec, and HackerOne. She's a hacker, an advocate for gender and economic equality, a cybersecurity fellow at New America and the National Security Institute, an advisor to the U.S. government, and once made a very unusual entrance to a cybersecurity conference in New Zealand. Welcome, Katie, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, so right off the bat, I have to ask, what was the unusual or what was unusual about the conference entrance? I think you're thinking of one where um, the portmanteau karaoke note was used, where I um, my entrance was a live karaoke session with backup dancers and pyro. And um, it was a song. It was Sia, but or it was Chandelier by, by Sia. But I had changed the lyrics to Cyberlier. And as soon as the lights went off after that performance, the lights came back on. And then I talked about export control of cyber weapons, which was a problem I was working on at the time. So it was, you know, entertaining and informative. Just for some background, what sparked your interest in computers and the hacking scene? Oh, my mom bought me a computer when I was eight years old and I didn't have any friends. So that was, it was a match made in heaven, you know, teaching myself how to program in basic on a Commodore 64 as a little kid. And then fast forward a few years, I was a teenager growing up in the Boston area, and there were a lot of hackers nearby. And I happened to stumble across a bulletin board system, which was a very early prototype of, of chat rooms that you would see um, in modern systems. And I joined this bulletin board system. It was flooded with hackers, and um, my hacking career began at that point. Before it was a career, it was a hobby. I remember the Commodore 64 and its small brethren, the, the VIC-20. So how did that morph into mm -hmm. a career in, in IT? Well, you know, when I was a teenager, that was actually the late 80s and early 90s. So just to place that all in the in the timeline of the Internet itself, the Internet wasn't very well developed. So I actually went to school for molecular biology, biochemistry and mathematics. And I kind of wandered back into cybersecurity because I was working um, on the bioinformatics team at the Genome Center at MIT and um, transitioned to become a systems administrator there, taking care of the networks and planning them. And we were being attacked a lot. So I had to dust off my cyber skills and um, I had to dust off my cyber skills and had to um, learn how to scan my own networks and prevent, you know, ideally prevent bad guys from getting in before I could find and fix the flaws myself. And then fast forward, I was a Linux developer um, and I started writing security tools for systems administrators. And then right around that time was the turn of the millennium and the dot com boom happened um, where, you know, that was one of the um, one of the big collapses in the, uh, you know, IT and computing and Internet industry. That was one of the first collapses right around that time. And I became an independent hacker for hire. Um, I joined up with my old friends that I had been, um, you know, part of their hacking groups when we were teenagers and they had professionalized into the company that you mentioned at the beginning called At Stake. And it was one of the earliest companies to do um, what today is well known as application security penetration testing or looking for flaws in application code as opposed to looking for, you know, sort of network level flaws. And, you know, my career just kind of went from there. For anyone who may not be familiar with the concept, what is a bug bounty program and what's the history behind them? Well, bug bounties are, you know, exactly what they sound like. If you find a security bug, you get paid a bounty. So it's a cash reward in exchange for security vulnerability information. And the history of those programs actually dates back to the mid 90s, where um, the Netscape browser, which became the um, 
the uh, Mozilla browser, um, they offered $500 if you found a security hole in their browser. And that was pretty much, you know, the going rate. And it was just that one browser company, not really too many other companies offering cash rewards like that. And then fast forward to 2010, Google started offering cash rewards for um, security holes in the very early Chrome browser at the time. Um, I think Chrome was maybe only two years old. So the code base was really new and they felt fairly confident. They had eliminated a lot of security issues and they thought to crowdsource, um, you know, and look for talent in, a, in addition to looking for the bugs that way. And then I started Microsoft's first bug bounty program in 2013, which spawned um, me being invited to the Pentagon. And then the Pentagon launched, we launched Hack the Pentagon in 2016. So things have kind of snowballed since then. But bug bounties have become a lot more popular and a lot more well-known. And the efforts of friendly hackers are more recognized today than they were, you know, a dozen years ago. Um, I imagine bug bounty programs are most successful when software vendors are able to structure their incentives to align with the motivations of hackers, whether it's money or recognition or, or, or competition, what, what have you. So is it easy or hard to achieve this, this alignment? Well, honestly, you know, hackers will do things for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, Microsoft, I mentioned, you know, we started the first bug bounties there a decade ago, and Microsoft was already receiving bug reports for free from researchers around the world. Close to 400,000 non-spam email messages a year were coming in to secure at Microsoft.com, the email address to, to report security holds. So um, it's often a misconception that cash is the way to motivate hackers and align their motivations with the organization. Um, you can use cash as a tool to focus the energy that's already there and the eyeballs that already might be looking. But if, for example, you try to um, outbid the offense market, like if there are people who are buying bugs in your software and you know they plan to use them to exploit them, um, et cetera, a lot of organizations think, well, we should we should try and pay more than that so that we motivate hackers to come to us instead. That's actually a losing strategy in the long term, because what you actually want is to build security in from the ground up. You want to be able to hire and recruit people who will be able to prevent and also spot and fix those bugs while the software is being developed. If you weigh too heavily on the reward side of things and reward only the bugs that remain after all of those secure development processes, you've actually set yourself up for a perverse incentive and you're going to gut your own hiring practices. I can tell you, you know, at myself as a teenager, I would never have sat through, you know, a corporate job interview or one-on-ones with my manager if I knew I could make as much or more money just doing bug bounties as opposed to, you know, kind of getting a day job in prevention. In terms of the time it takes companies to fix bugs, how long is too long? Well, that's a complicated question. So um, for web vulnerabilities that, you know, that you control the code base and you're not, you don't have a lot of third party uh, supply chain dependencies, you know, you should be able to turn those around fairly quickly. Um, for code that runs on your customers or your users' machines, you probably have to do a lot more testing. And so it'll take closer to, you know, the what 90 days is sort of been settled on as an industry norm of a reasonable amount of time to fix things. But if you have something that involves hardware or tricky supply chain issues, that may take you quite some time and you may be able to produce a fix, but getting it out there and getting it deployed in the places where the actual vulnerabilities live, you know, out in the field, in the world, that may take a lot longer. So it's a little bit of a complicated answer, but software is not straightforward these days. For... Um... For company product programs, software company product programs, they typically consider things like, uh, you know, what features do we want to release? Uh, sometimes they'll have releases focused on performance. Sometimes releases focused on um, uh, just general bugs. And, and security, you know, I would imagine should be one of the things they consider as part of their core development program. But um, software companies also have a huge interest and investment in their intellectual property. So how do you address some potential... Uh, concerns that they might lose control over their products if they launch a 
bug bounty program? Well, I think the idea there is that they should be building security in from the ground up. A lot of organizations, even publicly traded companies, have no, no real incentive to do that. Um, we don't have software liability laws, so there's nothing really out there to punish companies that are negligent when it comes to software security. Um, but, you know, in terms of putting out a bug bounty and worrying about their intellectual property, I think uh, most organizations that put out bug bounties understand that if a security researcher can figure out how to break it, um, probably bad folks are also figuring out how to break it. And you're better off working with the security researcher community to find out where those weaknesses are, as opposed to, let's say, you know, waxing litigious with them and accusing them of illegally reversing your software. Um, I don't know how the laws are are going in Canada, but in the United States, at least, the Department of Justice has put in prosecutorial guidelines that essentially help to protect researchers, you know, given that DOJ can't change the law, um, you know, and, and suddenly make um, every uh, friendly hacker suddenly an authorized hacker. But what they can do is they can provide that prosecutorial guidance that, that essentially says, if someone has done this in good faith and tried to tell you about a security flaw, it's just not good form to try and go after them legally. On a similar theme, what's the difference between a bug bounty claim and a ransom demand? Well, that one is interesting because a lot of bug bounty hunters um, don't speak English as a native language. And so sometimes they are simply asking, do you have a bug bounty or is this eligible for a bug bounty? Um, but it comes across as more of an extortion attempt of saying, you know, I would like to be paid for this bug, you know, et cetera. So I would say that you do have to have a bit of conversation with, uh, with a researcher if they are asking about a uh, cash reward uh, before you can determine whether or not it is, uh, you know, it is, it is a, an unreasonable request or not. Now, that being said, you know, there are there are definite, you know, attempts to extort and folks that just come right out and say, I have bugs in your system, I've exploited them, I know all of this data about you, and I'm going to release it to the public unless you pay me. That is a very clear cut that that's not looking for a bug bounty, that's looking for an extortion payment. And um, the company Uber actually got in trouble for covering up a breach of 57 million records by trying to launder it through their bug bounty program and their bug bounty service provider knew what was going on and was complicit with this whole you know idea of this cover-up of paying through the bug bounty program in exchange for a non-disclosure agreement about the breach that the hackers signed um and uh you know and that was essentially them covering up what was um, what was an elevated extortion attempt uh, by these researchers. They didn't actually know about the bug bounty program when they reached out to Uber. They just said, we found some things and we, you know, we'd like to get paid. Why should a company use a service provider likely to security for its bug bounty program? What's the worst that can happen if they go us alone? Well, what a lot of people do, and actually a lot of governments do, is the concept of bug bounty is very easy to explain. And they make a mistake of thinking that since the concept is easy to explain and understand, the execution must also be very simple. And the problem is it's just not, you know, in a lot of cases, um, organizations may start out strong with some dedicated individuals who carry the weight of these programs programmatically, you know, and make sure no bugs end up unfixed for a long period of time, et cetera. But then eventually those people burn out. And so what Luta Security usually does with organizations is we do a maturity assessment first. And if an organization is not running a bug bounty program yet, and they're interested in starting one, we look at their vulnerability management skills. So it's almost like testing their muscle memory for how do they patch bugs that they already know about or that they find through their own scanning? How healthy is that process? Because if that process lags behind significantly, can you imagine what it's going to be like burdened with a whole bunch of bug reports coming from the outside? It ends up being a distraction from other, you know, 
higher ROI, higher return on investment security activities, and it ends up burning out your staff. So what we do is we do a maturity assessment. We offer two pathways. We either say, this is what it will take to run a sustainable program and how many people you need to hire and what roles, or we can handle it for you. And we know how to hire and train for these roles. Um, and we've placed them in governments and large organizations around the world. With, uh, pre I say pretty much, with pretty much uh, every company having a presence on the internet now, I say pretty much because we actually came across a company in, in Germany recently that had no internet presence. And we thought it was very odd. Um, but how our did you find vulnerability. Them? Did you find them on the street? Like, how did you? <laughs> they they, they, they reached out to us. Sir. We, didn't, we didn't find them. They reached out to us. And then we, we did a look up <laughs> uh, of the company in public records to make sure they weren't something untoward. Um, right. It, it was quite unusual, though. Um, but so do vulnerability disclosure programs, uh, are they limited to software vendors or are they applicable to, you know, a construction company, a healthcare company, companies that, that don't develop specifically software? Yeah, I mean, every organization that uses computers and the Internet can benefit from a vulnerability disclosure program if they have the mechanisms in place to handle uh, vulnerability management. So if they have sort of ignored that bit and thought to themselves, now is a good time to start a vulnerability disclosure program and we'll just kind of build it all as we go. That's that tends to be a recipe for disaster. Um, but organizations that don't write software themselves, that simply use other people's software, that software, that third party software still has to be maintained. It still has to be configured correctly um, and it still has to be updated periodically. So um, vuln disclosure programs work for infrastructure issues like that and they work for whether or not you make software yourself. When should a company start thinking about having a bug bounty program? Well, I mean, they can always think about it from the beginning, but it really does matter how much preparation they do and where they've decided to weigh, you know, kind of their security investments. Um, we actually turn away a lot of companies that are too early in their security journey because they were misinformed and they were told that, First thing they have to do is start a bug bounty program. You know, they're building out their security program writ large, and they've been told by somebody that that this is a thing that they need. And it's absolutely not the right time for them. Um, you will, like I said, issues like staff burnout, but also distraction. If you have limited staff that can look at security issues as a whole, you don't want them dealing with uh, a bunch of bug reports, even if the bug report feed has been curated for you by let's say a bug bounty platform that you know will triage the issues and only send you the valid ones that still represents you know a potential flooding of an organization so i would say they can think about it from the beginning but they need to think about it as part of an overall investment strategy that has its place once they have done some security prerequisite work on their own so katie you've been you've been in uh, bug uh, bounty programs for a while now. So since they've been more and more common, have we seen an improvement in, in security overall with the prevalence of these programs? You know, certain mature programs, I would say the answer is yes, but these organizations, I call them the security 1%, and they sort of already had those earlier investments in proactive security set up and in place. And they actually had pretty good reactive security as well. Um, but most bug bounty programs and most vulnerability disclosure programs lack some of the essential closing of the loops, right? They'll, they'll, the bugs will come in, they may fix, you know, the majority of them, but they don't actually update their processes to prevent those types of bugs from happening again. Again. And I think, you know, without closing that loop of not just bringing it back into your security development lifecycle, but actually elevating your security practices so that you can wipe out entire classes of bugs, I think that piece has been missing from the security 99%, which is everybody else who hasn't learned those maturity lessons yet. Um, it just eventually becomes less of an efficiency and more of an operational burden in those cases. Um, I do think that 
you know, there's some research that I'm doing as part of a National Science Foundation funded research project that's going to be looking at exactly that. How effective have bug bounty programs and vulnerable disclosure programs been at reducing not just the number of vulnerabilities left in, in any given system, but reducing the severity of them and making them harder to discover? So ideally, you should be left with more and more difficult to find difficult to exploit vulnerabilities. If you've been running a bug bounty program or a vuln disclosure program for a few years, and you're still getting reports for things that can be found with a free or relatively inexpensive scanning tool, then you definitely have missed some of those loop closing steps because you clearly aren't running those tools yourself and you're relying on the crowd to run them for you. It's very inefficient that way. So it does depend. It depends on um, how well you're closing those loops and whether or not you, you know, you have learned some lessons and aren't just playing whack a bug. So, so based on what you said, then has vulnerability disclosure itself improved in recent years? I think the awareness that you should have some way for people to tell you if they are friendly, if, for them to tell you about a security vulnerability, I think that awareness has definitely improved in the last decade. Um, like I said, a lot of people understand the concept very easily at this point, whereas a decade ago, um, not as many organizations were even considering it. And I know, um, I know I made a lot of big companies very unhappy when I um, had Microsoft join the bug bounty train because they were looking at it as, you know, almost like a, a an understood pact among the older software companies. They knew they couldn't bounty everything. They knew they weren't going to be able to keep up with the volume considering they were already getting quite a bit of volume of cases. And I think that, you know, um, over time, like the, the, resistance to the concept of vulnerability disclosure and bug bounties has gone down, but also so has, you know, almost that um, original understanding of how do we even fix the bugs and prevent the bugs that we know about or should know about already. Moving beyond the bug bounty programs for a moment, what should organizations really be paying attention to when it comes to security now? What are some common shortcomings you see? Well, honestly, you know, I look at organizations as it doesn't matter what their size is. It matters what their security and privacy responsibility is. Um, a couple of years ago, there was an audio social media app called Clubhouse. It got popular during the pandemic because people, you know, wanted more than just texting each other, et cetera, and sending memes. They wanted to be able to talk to each other. And I got on that platform and, you know, accidents happen. And I happened to stumble across some security holes. I reached out to the company. They had a bug bounty program, but it was incredibly difficult to get them to engage. And they tried to basically make me sign a non-disclosure agreement via, you know, reporting the bug through one of the bug bounty platforms. And it was clear that they had heard about this vulnerability before. Uh, but they hadn't chosen to fix it. And so when I held them to, you know, saying, look, I'm going to disclose this publicly. If you don't, if you don't feel like fixing it, that's fine. But I think the public should know that they are at risk. And so back to your original question, um, I think, honestly, it's organizations, no matter what their size, need to look at how many users are they affecting? What kind of information are they, um, are they in charge of protecting? with those users and kind of match their security and privacy efforts accordingly. Um, that company, you know, we, we haven't heard much from them in a while, you know, that I think their excitement around them died down. But at the time they were valued at over a billion dollars and they had just received a hundred million dollars in the bank. They had fewer employees at their company than I have at mine. And so they absolutely had not invested in security at all, except for starting a bug bounty program. And that was their sole security investment at that stage. They were at probably 10 million or more users at that point. And they weren't living up to their responsibility to those users in terms of security and privacy. So I would say if an organization is thinking about where should we invest, where should we start? 
start by looking at, you know, what is it that you were trying to protect? Um, what kind of information are you stewarding for your users? And how many of them are there, you know, and try and grow your security and privacy practices according to the population you serve, as opposed to, um, you know, leaving it until you gain a certain, you know, overall market share, et cetera. I think you've sort of spoken to this with that answer, but um, what are what are some of the mistakes that you've seen companies do when they introduce bug uh, bounty programs? Aside from you know sy uh, systemically not having security as part of their development process, uh, you know, have there been mistakes that have been um, uh, really kind of what was I thinking? Well, I mean, a lot of organizations think that. Um, paying out higher amounts of money will be, you know, will be the ticket to better bugs, uh, better bug reports and better security. But often all that does is it just kind of raises the bug bounty awards for mediocre bugs. And, you know, still some of those bugs that you could have found yourself or could have hired penetration testers to find. I think another one is being over ambitious about the scope and then having to shrink back the scope of the program, and then falsely thinking that slapping a non-disclosure agreement around your bug bounty program protects you and protects your users from, you know, exploitation and or, you know, the bugs being disclosed to the public before you fix them. All it really does is annoy um, the good Samaritan researchers who would like to tell you about security issues, but they don't really necessarily owe you that for free if you are offering, you know, bug bounty rewards for, for some of your bugs, but a lot of your serious bugs are not rewarded. So there's the overscoping and being too ambitious. And then there's the underscoping and trying to clamp down on researchers with non-disclosure agreements, which really don't belong in bug bounty or vuln disclosure programs. They do belong in penetration tests, but you also shouldn't sit on the results of a pen test forever and not fix them either. You mentioned the Uber case before. How common do you think things like that actually are? Was Uber an outlier or is that type of thing more normal than we realize? Well, I think it's remarkable that, um, you know, that, that one Uber thought this was a good idea. And honestly, I think the fatal flaw and why it may be very prevalent actually um, is that these bug bounty platforms sell the illusion of control. They don't really sell you a process. That's up to you, you know, to do. Um, all they sell you is, you know, essentially we will eliminate, you know, the bugs that are duplicates. We will eliminate the ones that don't reproduce, you know, that can't be reproduced. And we'll have all of the researchers effectively signing non-disclosure agreements when they join the platform. And so I think um, to your question about how often. Similar. More commonplace than we realize. So I think the fatal flaw in that system is the illusion of control that is being sold by the bug bounty platforms. If non-disclosure was not on the table, I don't think Uber would have had the idea to use the bounty platform to pay off um, their extortionists and their, you know, essentially pay for silence in their 57 million record breach. Um, I think that probably a lot of organizations are saying that, saying to themselves, well, you know, even though customer records were breached, we don't have to tell the customers in this case, we can just pay the bounty and rely on the non-disclosure of the platforms um, to keep this quiet, you know? Um, so they, I think it probably is happening a lot more often. And unless um, regulators get very serious about telling, you know, these intermediary service providers like bug bounty platform companies, that, you know, you cannot be a party to essentially hiding a breach that otherwise would have been disclosed. Um, I think that this is going to go on for, for quite some time. We've watched the ransomware problem get worse year after year. Do you think governments, and the US government in particular, has done enough to combat it and cybercrime generally? 
Ransomware is an interesting question because the vulnerabilities that the ransomware actors are taking advantage of have always been there, right? They've always been um, possibilities of, of having these organizations hacked in that way. I think that part of the growing ransomware problem is the rise in cryptocurrencies and the ability for um, for attackers to monetize their attacks directly with victims in that way. So I think it's, um, you know, if governments were to impose stricter, um, you know, stricter uh, criteria for cryptocurrency operators in knowing who their customers are, I think that would cut off a lot of the um, attractiveness of the anonymity of payoff and getting away with it um, that ransomware actors really rely on. They can always you know, go outside the United States to use different uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, however, without those kinds of restrictions. So I think it would have to be multiple governments around the world, similar to how the banking industry has regulated around the world um, to try and make sure that uh, criminal activity can be traced and stopped. Um, via the financial sector. On the causality on the vulnerability side, I think that is that has always been present and we're just seeing a monetization of it by cyber criminals in the ransomware variety because of the rise um, of the value and the anonymity and ease of use of cryptocurrency. So, so to that point, do you think that really blocking access to the money should be the focus of policymakers? Or, or, somehow or is there anything else? The is there anything else that they can yeah, be focusing on to help to help protect uh, the average yeah. user? Well, honestly, you know, um, the the biggest problems are critical infrastructure such as um, utility providers, power plants, oil and gas pipelines. They are privately owned, and they are typically, um, you know, typically it's it's a problem where they do not have any cybersecurity professionals at all, or they have one and they are basically there, you know, keeping the IT networks up and running, but not necessarily focused on cybersecurity. So I think that for critical infrastructure, which is not, you know, all the victims of ransomware, we, we see a lot of softer targets like school districts and things like that, city governments and, and folks, but it's really a lack of um, cybersecurity personnel that are at these organizations that could even respond um, or try to prevent some of these issues from happening. So I would say, you know, government support for um, at least critical infrastructure and, you know, major cities getting more budget and more help and guidance in hiring cybersecurity professionals um, to, to even, you know, batten down the hatches when the, when the storms come, I think that would be a big, big step. But we often see, you know, in this brand new industry, less than 20 years old, you know, of, of the professional uh, part of the cybersecurity industry, um, we see a lot of job requisitions that are looking for unicorn rock stars with a decade of experience. So that not only limits who you can hire, right, because there are very few people who have that much experience, you know, in the workforce itself, but it also cuts off the ability for you to hire and train folks you know, and, and improve the cybersecurity workforce pipeline itself. So I think if governments were to focus on cybersecurity workforce uh, pipelining and getting more people um, who have an interest in cybersecurity, hands-on paid internships to start growing that workforce that can then be distributed, you know, around um, not just critical infrastructure, but to more state, local, city governments. I think that would help a lot as well. Do you think we can actually beat ransomware or is it just something we have to learn to live with and minimize the effects of it as far as we can? You know, that's like saying, can we, you know, can we ever beat the cleverest hackers? And I would say, no, we can't, you know, but we can improve our time to detect. We can improve our resilience in, you know, the face of an attack. What happens when you actually find, find out that you've been attacked? Um, in increasing the isolation of affected systems. Um, so I do think we can get better at it. You know, it's kind of like 
looking at turn of the century medicine versus the you know medical industry today and everything certainly we've made a lot of advancements in the science of it but we've also grown the workforce we've grown skill sets we've differentiated different skill sets so i think um a lot of it has to do with the fact that we do not have a very old profession um and we unfortunately built our society's dependence on these computer systems and the internet before we actually were equipped to deal with securing it. So will we ever beat ransomware? Um, probably not, but we can definitely improve just like antibiotics improve the uh, health outcomes of many, you know, of many people in the, in the civilized world. So uh, just to wrap things up, I think this is something we ask everybody, Katie, do you think, uh, there should be any prohibition or limitations on the circumstances in which ransom demands are paid? Um, so I think that's a difficult question, right? I think that, um, I think that a decent deterrent to paying ransomware would be a requirement that you report that you paid ransomware. Um, because I think a lot of organizations look at it like, look, if we just pay this quietly, we can get back to work, you know, get back to, to business. We'll just say we had an outage, you know, and that we're better now. Um, and I think that that really does the public a disservice. So I think if we wanted to deter um, the payment part of it from victims, we should probably make it a requirement that they publicly disclose they paid and how much they paid, et cetera. Um, I know the ransomware task force that assembled in the United States, um, you know, they were considering making a recommendation to make ransomware payments illegal, right? Um, to try and deter uh, organizations, victim organizations from actually making those payments. However, if a victim organization is staring down an existential threat and they cannot recover their operations, they honestly have no choice but then to do that illegal thing if it were illegal, right? Or else they have no business. So I don't think putting that much of a burden on the victims is really going to result in what you want, which is to shine more of a light on who needs help and who, you know, who, who needs to uh, warn their users that there was a material breach like that. So I would say it's about um, it's about requiring notification upon payment of ransomware that we should focus. That's a that's a great side. That's a great perspective. And with that, I'd like to thank you, Katie, for joining us today. It's been a, a really interesting and helpful conversation. And we'd also like to thank our listeners for tuning in. To uh, stay up to date on, on the latest in cybersecurity, be sure to subscribe to our podcast. Thanks again, Katie. Take care.